and hello everyone. Um, delighted to be here today to facilitate our conversation. Uh, and the question that we're exploring today is, what are the social implications that we should be considering for the ethical and sustainable delivery of emerging technologies? So what I'd like to do in exploring that question is ground some of the concepts and ideas that we hear about a lot, so trust and ethical AI, within a conversation on how we can make technology better and create it within some sense of a social good. So the structure of the session today is um, I'm going to introduce our panel and then each of our participants is going to have five minutes to tell us a story that outlines their perspective on the societal implications of emerging tech. We're going to reflect on some of the draft legislation that we've very recently seen out of the EU that aims to regulate AI and then think about how that applies to Australia uh, before talking about how we ensure that we deliver AI and other deep tech in an ethical and sustainable manner. I'll open to audience questions in um, uh, just under an hour. So please be ready with your queries. Use the Q&A function in the Zoom at any time to help us get started during that Q&A session. Okay, so on to the exciting part, our fabulous panel today. We have four people joining us who have an incredible breadth of expertise in emerging technology. And I could talk about their work all day, uh, but we don't have that long. So here are just a few highlights. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Rachel Thomas, the founding director of the Center for Applied Data Ethics at the University of San Francisco, which addresses harms like disinformation, surveillance and algorithmic bias and other misuses of data. Rachel is the co-founder of Fast AI, which is a non-profit research lab making deep learning more accessible and widely applicable, and was selected by Forbes as one of 20 incredible women in AI, uh, and is a former software engineer. Next up, we have Dr. Michael Gio, a senior lecturer at QUT and deputy chair of the Society on Social uh, Implications of Technology in Australia. His research examines the intersection of new technology and law and the impact of new technologies on power and governance. Then we have Dr. Kate Zevitt, Chief Scientist of the CRC for Trusted Autonomous Systems and an adjunct professor in human-centered computing at UQ. Kate's research draws on her expertise in epistemology, cognitive science and ethics, and aims to ensure the development of autonomous systems that incorporate ethical, legal and regulatory structures. And last but not at all least, we have Professor Paul Hanman, Chief Investigator at the new Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society and a Professor at the UQ School of Social Science. His research investigates the nexus between social policy, admin administration and digital information technologies. So that's a lot for everyone to take in. Let's put that into context. Uh, with some stories. So starting with Rachel. Rachel, in 2019, you wrote a blog post on what scared you about AI. What drove you to write that blog post? And do you feel the same way now? Um, thanks, Tara. Yeah, so I, uh, I actually had to go back and look at the blog post. And um, no, those are still five of my top concerns. Um, so this is two years ago. Um, but I wrote about concerns. And actually, let me check. Should I be telling my story now um, that I want to share about um, impact yeah. on society? OK, and so um, um, <laughs> the story I was thinking of actually illustrates kind of several of my concerns. Um, and so this story uh, comes from the US. Um, and I, uh, I recently moved to, to Queensland just in the last two months. Um, but in the US, there is software where there's an algorithm and it uh, kind of was developed. It's proprietary. The creator of it's earning royalties, but it determines people's public um, health benefits um, if they're on Medicare. And it's used in many of the 50 states. And when it was implemented in one state, Arkansas, there was a bug in the code that incorrectly cut healthcare for people with cerebral palsy. Um, and so these were people that need a, a home health aid to help 
help them get out of bed in the morning to get their breakfast, um, kind of very, very basic um, quality of life um, task. And they received a drastic cut in the amount of care they were receiving um, due to this AR. And then unfortunately, there was no um, timely or meaningful way to surface errors. And so the, the people impacted were like, you know, this is terrible. And they couldn't get an answer for why it was happening or, or more importantly, how to appeal it um, or seek, a, seek to have it changed. And eventually after months, this comes out through a court case, uh, the errors discovered and it's, it's addressed. Um, but this is a really, I, I find it to be a very chilling story. And it illustrates kind of several things um, that are uh, sadly common patterns. Um, and so the first is that computers can make mistakes. Um, and this was not using AI, but AI can make mistakes as well. However, humans have something called um, automation bias, where we often assume if something's coming from a computer or it's coming from AI, that it must be, um, you know, completely accurate. It's not going to have errors, that it's um, showing better judgment than humans. And that's not the case. And so it's really, um, really important to keep in mind that uh, computers make mistakes. Um, secondly, this issue where there was not a, a, a way to discover errors or for people to highlight them, um, this is common as well. And I think it's really crucial that when we consider um, automated systems that are impacting people's um, people's lives in significant ways, that we need timely and meaningful ways for them to make appeals, um, to, to, get, to get errors corrected, and to, and to challenge and contest um, what, what algorithmic systems may be saying about our you know, ability to, to get a job, um, about criminal justice um, sentences, uh, yeah, education opportunities, um, things that really, really impact our lives. Um, and then the uh, kind of a third thing that this really illustrates uh, is that in the system, nobody and they, you know, they ended up uh, kind of seeing the journalists that did an investigation interviewed, you know, the creator of the algorithm and policymakers, and nobody really felt responsible. Um, you know, nobody saw it as like, hey, it's my responsibility to catch errors or to explain to the people impacted what's going on. Um, and this is really common in complex systems, and it's common in bureaucracies. Um, it's not distinct to computers, we see this in human bureaucracy as well. Um, but as Dana Boyd highlighted, often automated systems are being used to extend bureaucracy. Um, and so kind of when we add these, you know, additional layers of complexity, um, and often it's not even, you know, sometimes there's a lot of kind of uh, passing the block, um, but in some cases it's not malicious, um, you just nobody really feels responsible because they think it's somebody else's duty to take care of this. Um, and so in this case, you had the, the creators of the algorithm saying, no, it's about about how the policymakers rolled it out, and the policymakers were like, "No, it's about the, uh, you know, the team of programmers that implemented it." And kind of everybody else, you know, everybody could point to to somebody else. Um, and so it's important to recognize how um, how computer systems can make make that issue of accountability worse. Um, so that that highlights. Uh, so those are kind of three key things: this issue around errors. Uh, this lack of uh, timely and meaningful appeals. Often automated systems are being introduced as a cost cutting measure and offering appeals is more costly. Um, and then this issue around responsibility. Um, so those are, those are three of the five that really worry me. Um, the others do as well. Uh, one is about just the kind of unaccountability and um, kind of huge power that, that tech companies have. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And that certainly um, sounds familiar, I think, in the Australian context, if you think about something like RoboDat um, happened a couple of years ago. So, um, Kate, I guess, also reflecting on this idea about bias when it comes to automation and being surprised when computers make mistakes. What does trust and safety mean when we think about robotics and autonomous systems? It's a great open question, Tara. So I'm going to try and provide a little bit of some of the um, uh, best and emerging best ways to unpack these ideas in a short amount of time uh, and encourage you to uh, get in touch if you'd like to have a more thorough deep dive on it. Um, but just a really pithy summary of uh, trust and safety from our, our director of uh, uh, autonomy accreditation in the air domain, Tom Putland, who's joined Taz from CASA. And he said, trust and safety, really hard to get and really easy to lose. <laughs> so um, it's uh, 
but then when we sort of boiled it down, we sort of like, look, it's, you know, trust is uh, some property or capacity of a system or set of agents um, that's predictable based on prior events. So reliability is a really key notion. And that actually is true in philosophy as well. So when philosophers have thought about just how do we trust other humans, they often think about trust um, in terms of being a sort of relationship. Um, we think about, we trust that shelf because we feel like we've actually put the screws into the wall and it reliably won't make our vases fall off and crash. Um, so those are some sort of um, basic ways to enter the tr trust conversation. Uh, but more recently, I actually found a really nice uh, diagram and I want to attribute it appropriately um, to two authors, Dupont and Karpov. Uh, actually, in the Journal of Business Ethics, I'm going to throw it up on the screen. Look, this is very unorthodox Zoom behavior. Normally, we have slides. Today, I have a printout, but I just, it, it's a scribbly printout too. But look, the trust triangle, it's really quite neat and I like it a lot because it's simple, but it gets to these different facets of trust. So one is this sort of personal integrity um, side of things where each individual has a, a, an obligation to have trustworthy relationships with others and uh, they have cultural obligations sometimes that change the way they behave. Um, and so that's at a sort of personal level. And then we have an organisational or group level which has things like discipline and reputation to think about and often reputation is a good um, a reason why people do things to be more trustworthy, right? Because they don't want to lose that reputation because what do we know? Trust and safety, hard to get, really easy to lose. Um, and then we have this sort of society-wide laws and regulation. Um, those systems and structures are obviously extremely important, but we can't just depend on them. That's not the only locus of where trust and safety um, exist. And then I will go to the next diagram, which I also really like, um, which is that if we want to break it down, it's not just about reliability, right? So trust is not just reliability. It's actually got something extra. So for example, Google Maps is one of the most reliable ways that we all move around. But if I was to ask you, do you trust Google, right? You might pause and you might say, well, look, I use Google. I use Google and I do rely on it every day. And I don't know exactly how I'd manage my life if I didn't use Google. Uh, do I trust Google? Well, maybe I wonder, perhaps with particularly the AI ethics um, debacle that's going on with Timurit Gebru and, and the other AI ethics researchers, you might wonder, you might think, well, I'm not sure if I do trust Google actually. So this tells us that there's something to trust that isn't just the same as having a shelf uh, that's wired correctly. So again, I'm going to pull up my little diagram here. So, so I think this is a really nice, this also comes from the business ethics uh, research literature, but I actually think it's really helpful uh, because it breaks it down into this competency and reliability um, aspect where you've got skills, experience, and things that bring build capacity. But then on the flip side, you've got your integrity. So what's the motives of Google, for example? Um, how honest are they with their customers? Uh, and when it comes to humans, we talk about character. So in defense context, which is where I work, we think about virtues and we think about um, the character of individuals. And we might wonder, like, how do we make sure that artificial intelligence and the systems where human decision making is being replaced by machines in various ways? Can we replicate this sort of trust model with those machines and humans and human systems? Um, is it symmetric or asymmetric? Is it um, that we think that the level of competency, for example, of a self-driving car needs to be far, far in excess to degree of hundreds of degrees, more reliable on the roads than a human driver, because there's something about that system and the firmware upgrade that if, if, you, if you had a patch to a Tesla network and it was a bad patch, uh, you could have simultaneously, you know, sort of, or roughly simultaneously, an incredible number of thousands of deaths um, from sort of an incompetent system upgrade. Uh, so we might have uh, asymmetric expectations between machines and people that are important to consider. Um, so I think those are a couple of good visual ways of thinking about trust. So you've got your trust triangle, which is individual, group, and society, and you've got this division between integrity uh, and competence that I think is assistive when we're trying to evaluate trust. Um, I think the conversation around trust cannot proceed in a, a, a very recent dialogue around AI ethics without talking about the end-to-end -end issue of AI production. Um, so I wanna draw everybody's attention to Kate Crawford's new book, The Atlas of AI. 
uh, power politics and the planetary costs of AI because there are material costs of building systems that can process data um, that contribute to environmental uh, considerations. There's very significant labor concerns when it comes to the production of categorizing artificial intelligence systems, particularly machine learning ones. Uh, so the gig economy uh, is really bad. So linguists, fully qualified linguists are being paid by Google on contracts um, without you know, permanent jobs, without a level of um, conditions that you might suppose would be reasonable for, for a very um, you know, competent person who's being trusted to um, manage the Google uh, Translate capability. Um, trust is also dynamic. So a researcher at TAS, Beth Cardier, she works at Griffith University and her specialty is actually thinking about trust narratives in dynamic open worlds because we can trust somebody uh, for, for sort of one task forever and all time. But mostly what we do is we actually navigate trust relationships and we change our degree of trust based on experience and change. And there are different things that can be signaled to us in the environment or in the person themselves. Like if they start getting dizzy or if we think they've drunk too much beer, we might be like, okay, generally I trust this person to get me home to my hotel room, but tonight, not right now. So there's ways we signal the way we should trust each other and that's okay. And that dynamic experience is part of what we need to build into machines also, that it's not a static moment that you trust or don't trust. You might have evolving trust. And finally, um, out of the University of Melbourne, there's a really interesting conversation uh, led by uh, Jacoby and uh, others, including Tim Miller for the Center of um, Digital Ethics, no, AI, Center for AI and Digital Ethics, um, this idea of trust contracts. So whatever it is that you think needs to go into a contract, you should uh, put it into the system of agreement between a human and a machine. And then again, humans can agree to a certain amount of interaction or engagement with a machine. And I think GDPR in the, U, um, in the EU goes some distance into having those trust contracts where you have, uh, you know, you have rights to your data, you have rights to be deleted, um, you know, that kind of um, negotiation around who's allowed what in the system and the human. I think is a really important uh, progression in the conversation around trust. So when it comes to safety, safety is very much connected to trust uh, and you need to get those uh, trust components uh, aligned. There is society expectations with trust around legislation and tort and common law. There's safety management systems, safety culture, operational risk, uh, risk management, change management and emergency management. That's all to do with the safety case. And then there's system safety itself, and that can be process or functional safety, human factors and human machine interface safety, technical compliance, systems integration, and hazardous materials management when it comes to safety. Uh, and I'll shout out to Andrew Scott um, from the Australian Robotics Network for his work uh, on that safety aspect. So I'll probably stop there. I'm sure I've taken up plenty of time. Thank you, Kate. So Paul, thinking about that blend of organizational, I guess, reliability and competency and then personal integrity. Um, and then thinking more about your work, which is, as I understand it, more around automated decision making as deployed by governments. What do you see as the main challenges in that space? Um, thank you very much um, for asking, asking that wonderful question. I I think I would like to start with a little story. Um, I've been uh, undertaking a research project about looking at the role of uh, government web portals, the entryway into government, um, and the way in which government designs its information management. But the story I'm going to tell you from this research is more a story about how cultures of uh, technological innovation create challenges that the challenges that both Ta um, Rachel and Kate have articulated. Um, I was undertaking an interview with the Canadian um, Chief, of Inform Chief Information Officer staff person. I, I will say it wasn't the Chief Information Officer, but within that office. And I was, and I was talking to them about what they saw as the future of uh, joined up government and data flows because Often you see when governments create a website at the national level, it is very much focusing on the national level. It's not actually truly countrywide. 
And they said, we really would like to see the integration, like Canada is very much a federated state like Australia. So they said, what we would like to see is the, these data flows and information flow through the system so that it becomes seamless. For example, the example they gave was with the child is born in a hospital, in a local, uh, it's a local authority, and that child is immediately registered. That information then gets flows through to the state level uh, and also the federal level. So they then get a social security number or and a health insurance number equivalent to the have in those countries. Um, and, and typically can also notify schools at the right time. And, and I, I said, this is great, but what happens if uh, things uh, throw a spanner in the works? For example, if there's an allegation that a child is at risk of abuse and neglect, um, and, then a, and that is loaded into the system so that police and educators and child protection systems all notify, but it turns out that that is not correct. How do you undo all that? And I kid you not, the response was, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Now that really concerns me, but it, as someone who did computer science as my first degree back in the eighties, um, this mentality that we are able to use technology to fundamentally control everything and make it all neat is what is one of the biggest problems. It, it, it has an assumption within that, that we are all similar. And that undermines the idea of gender, sexuality, race and ethnicity, a whole range of differences. It under, uh, under, and undermines the questions of ability and impairment. That is not fed into that, uh, into that mindset. And so really we need to start to think about how do we design technology to support processes and not assume that one size, one algorithm will fit all, like one run ring, run ring to rule them all, one algorithm to rule them all. And whilst we're very good with our new technologies of able to distinguish different groups of people differently, and that's where we're starting to see a whole lot of more um, nuance in the way services are delivered in, the, in both the government system and in the private sector, we can't always do that equally and appropriately. And we need to be able to have some nuance around that. Um, so getting back to that question about what are the big issues for ADM or automated decision-making in, in society is that the discussion so far is what it for me tells me is actually it's not about the technology um, or the newness of AI. All of these questions have been around for decades and it's not just about computers, it's about how do we design technology in light of the people that are going to be um, affected by either be used uh, by them or they, the outcomes for them. And so we need to stop, often stop and think about, it's actually not the technology, the newness of the technology, but the way in which it's used. Um, and I think that Rachel really articulated some really important points around our accountability, and I won't go back into that. Um, but import, one of the important things is that the relationship that governments have with people is very different than the relationship that corporations and markets have with people. States have a power of coercion and control. And when we see the use of technology um, in social services, which is often working with the most poor, the poorest, the most disadvantaged, the most vulnerable, we see the way in which technology is used often as a form of enhancing control and power and surveillance. And I think I'm gonna go back to Rural Benjamin's book, Race After Technology. So she says in her opening, how, opening chapter, that the way in which you've been positioned in relation to the state, the way in which you've been positioned in relation to technology will fundamentally change the way in which you perceive how technology is being used. Um, so if you have seen that, that it being used in the past as a way in which to subdue, to subdue and control, then you're going to be suspicious that that's the case. And a colleague of mine here at UQ, Amelia Radke, has been doing that very certain, same similar words, research with indigenous people and the way in which digital technology, such as reporting with the fingerprint um, to a parole officer instead of as, as the parole officer instead of an individual, 
or you're using the fingerprint to actually get into and visit your, um, in, uh, your Indigenous family within prison, um, people are suspected about that because the whole background, the whole cultural heritage of colonialism means that there's a suspicion of this is about control. Whereas if we come through as person of educated middle-class white people, we don't see that. And this is fundamentally why we actually need to start to think about what is the way in which bias from our human bias and also the bias that's embedded with our technologies whether it's the data that's fed into it. So we have people that like our, the example of Tay that started to sprout racial um, um, diatribe really quickly because it learnt from Twitter that that's what you do. Um, so we need to actually be aware of the way in which technology is involved in reproducing or enhancing potential social barriers rather than um, rather than ameliorate them. So I think that's one of the key things I'd like to say. Thank you, Paul. So in less than, I think, 15 minutes, we've heard about some pretty significant issues uh, when it comes to AI and emerging tech. Michael, these technologies can clearly be deployed across many different areas and aspects of society. How do we come to an agreement on what constitutes ethical use? Yeah, thanks, Tara. Um, before we got the, the talking points for, for today, I started to jot down things that sprung to my mind as social implications of, of new technologies, at least. And I'm looking into power at the moment, so it's sort of influenced by power and money and, and looking at things like targeted advertising, um, you know, that data collection, storage and use, um, bias and asymmetrical information. Um, but also things uh, like AI and so I had to categorize them because there were so many, but AI and services. So policing and court systems and, and uh, healthcare and education. And when, I, I don't know about you, but when I start thinking about those things, all these subtopics start springing to mind, all these problems with, with uh, uh, social implications of technology in these areas. Um, for instance, AI and work, um, it's issues of privacy, um, and and um, what Corey Doctorow has, has called the humans as ad adjuncts for robots. You know, we'll be doing the bidding of, of the robots. Um, but in, also in places like health safety and, and um, workplace, um, or work in the workplace, you know, safety in the workplace and that sort of thing. Um, so the, all these issues started to spring to mind, all these things that kind of when you're looking at this area, they become uh, they become part of your the fabric of your your being almost. Um, so the problems are, are there; they're, they're they're happening at the moment, and it raises issues about you know how the technology is developed um, versus how it's ultimately used. And Paul uh, sort of hinted at that. Uh, and we need to look at things like the speed of development and the lack of foresight when it's being developed. Um, and I think um, for speed of development, computer vision is probably a good example. Uh, computer vision was one of the aims of, of um, John McCarthy and the, the sort of Dartmouth crew in 1956. And there was a long development of, um, of computer vision, you know, and developing in the 70s and 80s. And then, um, you know, being able to identify a cat in a picture was a big development uh, and so on and, until really recently when when um, uh, in the um, the challenge that sort of uh, image net challenge where you know the um, the ability of computers to to recognize images sort of took off at a at a sort of uphill rate, overtook the humans, and they stopped the competition <laughs> in 2017. Um, so that, that speed of, of, of development has, it causes problems, probably tied to the ability to foresee what, what, the, what you're developing, uh, what, what impact it might have, you know, um, and there's issues of foreseeability raised in the new EU, uh, EU laws, but, um, but you know, what do people who are developing these technologies think when they're when they're developing them? 
what might be the ultimate use. And I think it's almost impossible now to, to be able to foresee every, um, every circumstance or every use in the future. For instance, who, who could have foreseen when developing computer vision back, back in the 60s and 70s, that it would be used in doorbells or, or, or to open your phone um, um, or to go to the supermarket and pick up your, your, your stuff and walk out the door without, without um, interacting at all. Um, who could foresee those things? Who could foresee what you could do with a $200 product from Amazon that you can get overnight? Who, and, and we haven't even touched on um, the malign use. What happens when criminals get hold of this stuff? So the EU law, um, I've, I've had a cursory look at it, and it seems to take a sort of direct approach to that sort of thing. It categorizes risks into those that are high risk, and, and there are a number of those listed in the schedule. Um, and it, it categorizes them for, uh, in terms of their foreseeability. What you can foresee, what can be reasonably uh, foreseeable use and misuse of AI um, uh, when they're regulating. And it defines reasonable foreseeable, reasonably foreseeable misuse as the use of an AI system in a way that is not in accordance with its intended purpose, but which may result from reasonably foreseeable human behavior or interaction with other systems. And, you know, as a lawyer, I just like to say thank you very much. <laughs> as soon as you introduce uh, reasonable foreseeability and use it twice in the same uh, definition, uh, it's, a, it's a holidays uh, on the Gold Coast for everyone. Um, but back to the, uh, the question of ethical use, um, and we, we see this, um, this outpouring, if you like, of, of ethical statements uh, and ethical um, pronouncements, even by um, uh, you know, the technologists themselves. So uh, Google and Amazon and Facebook, et cetera, formed, originally formed the Partnership on AI and, 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 and its proclamations of, of um, ethics statements and tenets um, uh, seems to seek to, um, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll use the word, ethics wash you know, their behaviors. Um, so, if, but ethics statements can be, can be effective in, in setting, uh, you know, what our agreed values or, or what, a, what a group or, or uh, a society can do, what it, what, what it wants its technology to do, what, how it wants to operate and its limits uh, on its operations. But having a clear set of ethics is one thing, but framing the laws um, that actually control and manage uh, behaviors is another thing. Um, having enforceable laws backed by sanctions, so penalties and criminal punishment, that sort of thing, it, uh, that's not what ethics statements do. Um, this is why we see you know, the partnership on AI, et cetera, happy, happy to espouse ethics statements, happy to abide by them, because what happens when they don't abide by them? Uh, nothing. <laughs> Nothing happens. Maybe a bit of, uh, maybe a bit of uh, societal backwash or, or backlash, but um, not that much. So um, there are two things that that they say you don't want to see being made: um, sausages and laws. Uh, uh, but ethics and values can be a good starting points for um, uh, to to flavour or uh, enhance or or begin the sort of legal. Um, process. Um, so very difficult to answer the question in the short term. How might, uh, uh, how do we get agreement? It's very difficult. Different societies have different uh, values um, and to try to harmonize those even within a country or within a block of countries like the EU, uh, let alone across, um, across national divides it's almost impossible to, to harmonize um, those, those type of things. Thank you, Michael. So, uh, Paul, Michael touched on the draft regulation that's coming out of the EU, uh, which appears uh, to focus on banning some forms of AI and then trying to address some issues of bias and discrimination. Would that work in Australia? Um, I'm thinking, specifically about some of those um, very detailed bans on things like uh, data being used to track individuals and in, in physical environments? 
how would we uh, receive that kind of regulation here? Thanks, Tara. Um, look, I'm not a lawyer and I haven't looked in great detail at the regulations, but uh, there is a lot of chatter um, in, the, in the circles that I'm in, um, welcoming those changes, but also uh, going through them with a rather significant uh, uh, fine tooth noodle, needle. needle. Um, I, I welcome the, the really serious attempt that the EU is doing in trying to think about all the ways in which what artificial intelligence and even digital technologies are challenging some of the practices and how do we ensure that states are able to regulate some of those things in a way that's more meaningful? My immediate response to the question about how does Australia respond is I think problematic is the context that we have. We actually don't have the same legal and cultural context. For example, our data protection laws and our approaches to privacy are so different today, those uh, in the EU. So we actually have that back. We don't have that, that context. And similarly, um, so it would be hard for us to just adopt something like that. Similarly, we have a whole, side, a whole lot of CCTVs. And in the case of Queensland, um, legislation was actually introduced through the um, Commonwealth Games so that uh, CCTVs visual recognition um, was used um, but in a way that could have breached now the Queensland Human Rights Act, but it was uh, hidden, it, the legislation hid how it was being used so it couldn't be questioned about how it was used. So we don't know whether it was tracking individuals, whether it was used for other purposes other than man crowd management or not. So I think we do have a cultural problem um, in terms of uh, our scepticism of the state and I think with the current um, pattern of ineffective use of technology um, by our governments, and also the way in which we've created a facial matching system, um, it's been not designed according to best practice, despite uh, being other ways to enhance privacy, it's been designed for control. Um, and so we do have a cultural problem in trying to adopt that because government hasn't demonstrated best practice anyway. So Kate, what do you think then? What are the, the better approaches for developing AI in ways that are kind of aligned with uh, the virtues suggested in the EU regulation, or maybe if you prefer to focus on an Australian context? Oh, it's so delicious. There's so many things to consider and so many limits with what we've got before us. I mean, I think what I want to flag is that the traditional way that regulation has been done, legal laws and regulation have been done, is not necessarily going to be the way, path of success in the control of the use of technology that people might be hoping to achieve by it. So let's just have a look at GDPR. Let's look at what happened to those that are most powerful in the AI space. So you've really got to understand that AI is about power more than anything else at the moment in terms of, I would say, the greatest ethical risks to humans and society. So you have the big AI companies that can afford to simply move their head offices outside of the EU in order to avoid having to be in compliance with a legal framework that applies within that jurisdiction. So the idea that you can put a legal framework into place and prevent bad actors acting badly for the bulk of humanity, I think is short-sighted, well, worse than short-sighted, it's just naive. Um, maybe it makes people feel good because they feel like we have done this thing, it's great. But in terms of if you're, I guess if you're judging people on the consequences of these laws or this regulation, whether it actually does the job you want it to do, I think you'll find that it is unable to counter the much more difficult question of how do we manage corporations that are in charge of all of the major data assets and all of the major infrastructure with regards to AI. And I'll use the COVID app tracing conversation from a year ago as a good example of what goes on when governments try to help their populations and are powerless in the face of big corporates. So basically Australia is a good example. Pretty, you know, you can criticize a government a lot, but a very proactive government thinking about their populace, trying to figure out what to do in this un 
unprecedented moment of time. So they think, well, let's look at what Singapore's done. Let's try to come up with an app. Let's do it quickly. Let's be fast government. Let's do it. We can do it. We're Australia. We can be fast. Let's make a thing. Let's make it happen. Let's be trustworthy. Let's do it. So they went ahead and tried to make this COVID safe app. And in that process of time, Google and Apple got together and made APIs for um, location tracking of people and basically told governments that there was no point in governments doing things. They should just rely on the fact that their entire population has their phones and their operating systems. You might as well leave this problem to the experts. Thanks very much, government, for your attempt. That's so cute. Good on you. So there's a problem with the cuteness of our governments and the cuteness of our laws and regulations that they don't apply to the those actors that have the greatest amount of power. So then there's an issue to do with the problem, I think, of just having not enough of the sorts of brains you need to write some of this documentation. So if you want to write this sort of documentation, you've got to be really careful. There was a terrible moment in the 90s where the internet almost got banned because a bunch of lawyers tried to um, make rules around www and urls and emails and um, could have tanked the whole endeavor um, by legislating the wrong thing so if you look at the appendixes in this eu regulation it talks about banned kinds of ai and the last time i looked although there's some contention on my twitter feed so please correct me if i'm wrong but last time i looked um like bayesian um mathematics was sort of banned <laughs> and it's just frightening because if you start banning mathematical functions from the ability of societies to use them for good, um, we are in a lot of trouble. So I think there seems to have been some potentially some mismanagement of an attempt to limit the use of artificial intelligence, but in doing so might actually do exactly like a terrible thing for health, um, trying to monitor the environment, like in terms of like how many species are in Cape York. Well, we did know because we use this cool mathematical um, technique, but now we're not allowed to use this technique anymore. Um, so it's just, again, an attempt to try and control at the wrong moment, I think. Some last comment would be, what's interesting about the difference in Australia and the uh, EU, you often hear this conversation, like our privacy rules are really awful and terrible and how could you possibly do what the EU is doing, which is incredibly visionary with GDPR and is really heading down the right direction? What are we going to do in Australia? And a lot of what's happened globally is even in the jurisdictions that don't have that GDPR obligation, you find cultural and uh, reputational reasons for adopting that standard, regardless of whether you're supposed, you have to do it, right? So as a startup in Australia, you would be foolish, in my view, to not look at those GDPR expectations, for example, like privacy statements that are actually understandable by regular people. As a company, a startup, a medium size or a large, if you don't have consciousness about those standards, those cultural standards, those ethical standards that are embodied in law in Europe and are not embodied in law in Australia, but I think you'll find that you need to start to build your data infrastructure and your communication standards to the best standard internationally, which is gonna be more like GDPR than not. So you might find that some of these laws actually get adopted in places where you don't have to uh, because it behooves those companies for their business model to be seen as a good actor in this space. Thank you, Kate. So Rachel, reflecting on that context, what does that mean when it comes to training people who are going to work in AI? Um, how does this uh, kind of regulation, but also just that context of ethical use influence the training that we want to provide? Yeah, um, so this is something, so with uh, Fast AI, where we teach, uh, we do research, but we also teach um, uh, uh, deep learning courses. We've included a component on ethics since the beginning. Uh, the Masters of Data Science program at the University of San Francisco that I used to teach in made, um, yeah, made a data ethics course mandatory. Um, I do want to I, I appreciate Kate starting with the, the triangle uh, where she highlighted the, you know, the need for uh, kind of responsibility on a personal level, an organizational level and a society level. Um, and I do think all three are very important. And so um, I think personal ethics are important, but they are certainly not going to solve these problems. Um, we really, um, as Michael noted, we we uh, need enforceable laws that are backed by meaningful penalties and sanctions. Um, and so we've really, uh, 
I think, been in the space where there are uh, not enough regulations kind of uh, governing the use of kind of so many technologies that are, you know, newly being applied to all these different areas of society, um, and where the, uh, even the laws that exist are often not enforced and not enforced in meaningful ways. Um, so an example of this uh, from the US, uh, we have civil rights legislation, you know, going back 40 or 50 years. Um, and uh, this includes um, the Fair Housing Act. And Facebook for, for years was letting people post um, housing ads and saying, you know, don't show this housing ad to African Americans or don't show this housing ad to Hispanic people. And this is something that seems like it should be illegal um, by the Fair Housing Act. And you know, this isn't new legislation, it's been around for decades. Um, but for years, there just didn't seem to kind of be any consequence for Facebook in allowing this. Um, and eventually there was a lawsuit, but even then I think the, the penalty was so small as really just to be pocket change for, for a company the, the size of Facebook. Um, and so you do have a yeah, have this issue where the kind of the regulations and the enforcement of them have not have not kept up um, that we have kind of such um, such powerful, powerful corporations. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's tricky, like I definitely uh, uh, try to encourage uh, uh, teaching about ethics and about the need for for uh, laws, regulation, also just standardization of kind of standardizing how we do things and getting clearer on kind of documenting them and what the appropriate use cases were and kind of how um, how our technology is being built and deployed. Um, but there is, a, a, yeah, there's still this kind of real gap where we do need the policy um, to really address a lot of these issues. Um, and, and, and in many cases, there's, um, you know, there's this balance of it definitely um, does make a difference for individuals to act with with ethics, but that also is not um, is not going to solve our biggest problems when the incentives are just so misaligned and companies can make huge profits in many cases by doing kind of very, uh, very harmful things. So, Michael, we've heard about how the context in Australia is very different when it comes to uh, the laws that we're coming, seeing come out of the EU. And also uh, a little bit about um, how, uh, how many obstacles there are for regulators in terms of creating meaningful uh, regulation in this space. What do you think the best option is um, today for regulators looking at the Australian context? Yes, uh, I think they should start. Um, I think they should. Um, it, it, the, the reason why the EU has been so successful is because they, they've had a plan, right? They, they started this four years ago or so when they got the, um, the expert group on AI. To, they got 50 prominent people talking about AI and suggested, you know, how are we going to tackle this problem of AI? Um, and then, you know, they, they kept going, <laughs> strangely enough, they kept going and they have these um, submissions on, um, oh, um, they had some submissions on uh, ethical aspects, one on liability and one on intellectual property rights, just, you know, October last year. So submissions building towards this regulation. So they, they not only began the process, but they continued on. Um, and developed these uh, and looked at all aspects or, or a lot of aspects of AI um, um, and also criminal laws, education and culture. They had other resolutions that were developed on this. And when you read the, the recitals or that first sort of 15 pages of background material to the, to the regulation, you can see that, that they've pieced it together bit by bit by bit by bit and built a case. Um, we, I think, uh, uh, um, we, well, we got Data61 to do some ethics principles about three years ago or two years ago, and now they're on the government website, and uh, <laughs> that's where it sits. But, but how do we get going? How do we get out of this malaise? Um, but there's, there's a lot of options, right? There's, um, and the question's about options. Um, uh, they're restricted a little by the the sort of regulatory environment that they that they inherit or we, that we've got right um, now there's a difference between laws laws that you know people most, most people think about laws as the um you know the statutes you know the um, statutes that get put out uh, and regulation 
But re regulatory theorists think of regulation, and Julia Black's one, she, she defines regulation as uh, the organised attempt to manage risks or behaviour in order to achieve a publicly stated objective or set of objectives. That's a really broad set of um, tools, if you like. It opens up um, not only law, legislation and regulations, but also uh, codes of conduct, self-regulation, uh, standards, tax breaks, incentives, um, a whole lot of things. Um, and regulators aren't just governments and their agencies, but, but can include um, unions or corporations doing, you know, changing behaviours, moderating behaviours um, intentionally. Lawrence Lessig um, talked about a regulatory environment that included um, four sort of modalities. He said, uh, one was law, you know, the important aspect of law, uh, but the, the others included the market, um, architecture, the architecture uh, of the environment and the norms of society, all sort of shaping behaviours. Uh, he used the example of um, seatbelts uh, and, and said, okay, if the government wants to, its citizens to wear seatbelts, um, you can pass a law to require people to wear seatbelts. Now, some will and some won't, right? Some will wear them and some won't. Uh, or you could fund a public education campaign you know, that one springs to mind, you know, that, that one, which, which creates a sort of stigma uh, and, and gets people to, like, in the community to sort of put pressure on people, you know, don't, you know get to wear your seatbelt. Um, or it could subsidise insurance companies, he says, to offer reduced rates on seatbelt wearers. That's the market sort of operating to, to um, control behaviour or um, regulate behaviour. And then... Um, this is his his big addition, which was uh, changing the architecture, controlling the the architecture of the thing. So he says, in in relation to seatbelts, you could have an ignition locking system, which would prevent you from from driving without a seatbelt. Now that's much more effective than than uh, writing a law, which you, which you could ignore. Um, uh, it, it actually prevents you. And, and uh, Roger Brownswords developed this, this to, to another point, which is, to, and he's talking about technological management. So using technology to manage, uh, manage behaviours. And th there's that whole design, privacy by design, and, um, you know, that, those sort of things by design. You know, you, you build it into the system to, to sort, of sort of create behaviours without actually having to you know, draft a law. Um, now, when you're talking about this, um, this area um, and the question, what, what, what's, what, what options do regulators have? Well, they've got all those options, but I think ultimately, you know, and, and Rachel's, Rachel's said it as well, um, this type of regulation by the EU, which has, um, which has, you know, it's your traditional sort of black letter uh, prevent, you know, preventative law, um, uh, which has 30 million euro penalties, right? If you do the wrong thing, um, it, it, it has a go. It's, it's quite well drafted. And whether we could adopt it in Australia, I think Australians, Australian law is sort of notorious for being bowerbirds of, of European legislation, we steal. We we have a history of stealing laws that are formed in other countries and just plonking them into our jurisdiction. And I, you know, with some modifications, you could see this, you know, be, being instituted here. But like I said, we, you've just got to start. Okay, so I'm mindful of the time and the fact that we've had a lot of questions pop into the Q&A. So why don't I um, pull out one of those for our panelists. Now, I think this question from um, Andra was uh, asked when we were talking about accountability and safety. Um, so they've asked, given that there's almost never a single developer of a technology, how do we um, I guess, address accountability with this. And they give us the example of Tesla's autopilot program in 2020, which was developed by a set of teams um, and, and not a single person. 
So does anyone uh, want to open the floor? Uh, can I call on you, uh, Michael, and then Kate, maybe first to talk about how we manage accountability in this kind of team um, environment? Um, yeah, yes, we have. We, we do have laws, right? <laughs> we do have laws that have been operating for uh, many, many, many years, uh, dealing with accountability for when things go wrong. Uh, when manufacturers um, uh, do the wrong thing or their products faulty, uh, we can sh we have laws which say, well, we can shunt that home to the manufacturer, that liability, um, uh, and that's that. Historically, that's worked very well. Uh, we have tort laws, but also in relation to um, consumer goods, we have this regime where we have uh, a specific um, tie back to manufacturers uh, for any loss or damage occasioned by their faulty goods. And I, I talked about foreseeability before uh, and tort law uh, just works on uh, foreseeability. It, it thrives on foreseeability. Uh, you are responsible for the foreseeable consequences of your actions. So uh, as I said, lawyers are, are happy when we talk about foreseeability. You know, there are four different sort of elements of foreseeability in the tort, in the tort question. But tort, tort law uh, or civil wrongs where, where, where people are uh, not criminally, but civilly uh, held liable for uh, their actions operates still and uh, I noticed in the um, recitals to the uh, to the new EU regulation they're happy to rely on tort law um, uh, still yeah I mean I think the uber um, test driver case is the best example of a difficulty we have in terms of managing accountability for situations where things go very badly um, so in that case the um, it was a test driver who was driving an Uber car. The uh, in, a, in a I think it was in Arizona where they were the state was very keen to encourage self-driving car test and evaluation. The car itself had parameters on safety that were dialed down because they were very annoying. They would give a lot of um, false positives, or at least the, the positives were not of a risk that would deem the driver needing to respond to them. So they were like, this is like too much noise bad from a human computer interaction perspective. So the car's safety parameters were dialed down uh, and the driver was in the car and was on their phone uh, in this probably very poorly paid, you know, test driver um, on their phone in their self-driving car, navigating the streets and a pedestrian walking a bicycle uh, entered the highway on an exit ramp. The AI actually was able to detect that there was an object ahead of the car, which I only found out recently. So I thought it was very interesting. So the AI actually detected that there was an object on the road at every point in time as that person with the bicycle was going across the road and heading over to the other side. Um, but it never uh, understood that entity as actually being a human uh, with a bicycle as a pedestrian. Instead, it interpreted the uh, trajectory of that uh, person as actually being a car heading off the off ramp. Uh, so sort of an interesting case where it wasn't even like the AI failed to notice this person um, but failed to uh, predict its uh, trajectory across the road. And then uh, that person uh, was unfortunately killed as the car uh, drove into the person and the person driving the car was on their mobile phone. Now, legally in the evaluation of those events, um, the person became the moral crumple zone and the legal crumple zone for the liability of that incident. Uh, they were considered to be most culpable for the death of the pedestrian. And there was no uh, claims made against Uber, the company, or any of the software engineers who were involved in the programming of the car or any of the decision makers that might have turned the parameters down of the safety or uh, any of the machine vision experts who, or the actually, it's not the machine vision at this point, it's probably the ones that did the algorithm of estimation from the point moments across the road. So you could actually really boil it down to the error. Uh, and, um, so uh, Floridi has a really nice um, paper on distributed moral responsibility. And uh, if you look at that, um, there are some attempts to do causal mapping and modeling and counterfactual reasoning to be like, if this algorithm had got it right, would that crash ha had have occurred? If the human was not on their mobile phone, would this crash still have occurred? And one might say that in this case, more of the responsibility of more of the causal oomph of, of how that pedestrian died probably falls on that error um, by the software 
uh, in not being able to predict the pedestrian, then it falls on someone who's got their on their mobile phone. But that's not the way the legal cases are running at this point in time. So it seems like there needs to be um, significant um, reconsideration about how these cases are, go through the legal process. And it's only going to be when there are actual ramifications uh, to the company at least, like the corporate entity at least, if not the individuals themselves who are involved in the process for there to be greater moral responsibility taken by individuals who are part of these systems. Um, and we're a long way to having the, often it's the law that really motivates companies. It's hard to get companies to do ethical stuff. If you're like, come to ethics training, they'll be like, am I, am I, am I, do I have, is it a compliance thing? <laughs> do I have to? And they're like, yes, it's a compliance thing. It's under this law. Okay. Can you organize it? We'll do it. Tick, tick, tick the box. Um, so we need to there's a lot of like in the future of adaptive regulation and the focus on how you can use different instruments to um, encourage behavioral change. So the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movements, they're not laws, they are social movements that generate a sense of obligation. And it may be that we need to get that sense of obligation and using the power of individuals uh, to have more of a protest capacity on organisations and groups that um, are not in abidance with their expectations in the way they manage accountability. But again, we're stuck in a loop here because we don't know how to let go of our phone. We don't know how to manage our lives without Google. We don't know how to deal with not having Facebook. How am I going to connect to grandma? We don't know how to not use Amazon Web Services. We're really hungry in a COVID lockdown. We want Uber Eats. So people don't know how to actually navigate the protest. I think that they actually would like to know how to navigate better. A good way of putting that, Kate. I did find that in um, in lockdown, I was a bit wedded to my phone and to Uber Eats. It was terrible. Uh, Rachel, I saw you nodding along uh, a bit there when Kate was talking. Was there anything you wanted to add to that? Sure. Yeah, I'll just um, I'll, I'll add an example of the power that. Um, yes, I certainly believe that. Um, I think with the right or <laughs> even just kind of better penalties and incentives um, that will help um, companies kind of restructure and reprioritize. Um, and so a kind of concrete example uh, kind of coming from, from Facebook, um, as early as 2013, people warned Facebook executives about the potential for genocide in Myanmar um, and that Facebook was being used to incite um, violence against the Muslim minority, the Rohingya. Um, and uh, Facebook failed to take any kind of meaningful action. And so they, even though they were kind of receiving regular warnings about this as of 2015, I think they went from having two um, content moderators that spoke Burmese to four, which is um, still kind of a very small number. Um, and to follow up, you know, eventually in 2018, the UN found that Facebook had played a determining role in the genocide there. Um, but in contrast, uh, Germany passed uh, a law about hate speech that was much stricter and threatened a 50 million euro fine against Facebook. And Facebook, this I think also might have been in 2018, Facebook hired uh, 1,200 German content moderators in under a year. Um, and so I just think about the, the contrast and the scale of the action there of years of warnings and only hiring a handful um, of Burmese content moderators and I realize there are issues around uh, language and availability, but it really seems like it was not a, not a priority at all. Um, in contrast with this threat of a 50 million euro penalty and hiring, you know, over a thousand people very rapidly. Um, and so I think that that gives an example. Um, yeah, of kind of how how the legal structure, um, I think companies will will reorient themselves um, if they feel like it's in their um, financial financial interest to do so. And I think that that's necessary. Um, and I will I will say that these are very, um, very difficult things to uh, to fight as individuals um, in that it. Um, yeah, it's hard. Uh, um, and I think that we really, uh, really do need kind of government, um, kind of government action to, to act as a kind of a counterbalance on the power that these companies have. I guess they have in many cases, yeah, created this, this infrastructure, um, which often, and there, there are plenty of examples, um, I know in the US and I imagine many other places of, 
local governments that use Facebook to share information. And if, you know, if you were to get off of Facebook, you may no longer have, you know, some access to, you know, to, uh, to view a, a city hall meeting or to kind of keep up on these updates. There are many schools um, using this and, you know, ditto, ditto with, um, um, with Google and kind of other, um, other of the major companies that have kind of become this infrastructure, um, but without, um, without the accountability that we, uh, you know, we typically expect from public infrastructure. Yeah, I guess we had a small scale example of that um, in Australia as well during lockdown, um, where Facebook banned our news sites. And so uh, the ABC broadcasts that were happening every day were suddenly non accessible to everybody and people were having to work out how to actually get there. Uh, so yeah, the, the need for the penalties, but also the fact that our government and, and our um, public broadcasters rely on that infrastructure uh, is something to reflect on. Paul, did you want to jump in with anything um, on this topic? Um, I've just responded on the, on the line and about the examples of the Boeing, I think the Boeing 747 or what was the, um, the one that crashed. And I think um, just like Michael said, we have laws, standard laws. We also have processes of oversight. And, the, the, and the, the reality is that we could start to look at processes of oversight, just as we have for the health, the pharmaceutical benefits, um, these, what the, not the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, but the um, PBAC, I think, uh, that, uh, uh, the therape Therapeutic Goods Administration that looks at the quality before approving. So we can have something like that or think about what is appropriate for certain types of things. Um, so there are institutional structures as well as legal structures, but um, the laws are problematic in, in, in some senses because it's such a drawn out, a long, expensive process that we can try to think about better ways to deal with that. It's an ongoing project, I would say. While I have you, Paul, our top question in the Q&A is a bit of a long one, um, but it boils down to uh, a question of how do we design technology while being skeptical about what it can achieve or whether it can achieve what it sets out to do? And what are the implications of a widespread understanding of the limitations of AI? Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a really good question. And I've been thinking about how I can answer that. Um, I guess as uh, Maximilian mentions that this is this trust is very much a social activity. It's not something that technologists can build um, into the technology. Obviously um, there are processes of reassurance that people can have like what testings have had. There are things like um, the, the chief scientist suggested having something like a uh, a Turing stamp to make sure that this, this particular AI has been approved and, and, and shows that it's consistent with our laws, for example. But if we look, if we've learned anything from the Trump administration um, and also the COVID world is that there are things that are well tested and go through lots of things that scientists uh, and would, would agree upon that are safe uh, or acknowledged, for example, our immunization system um, for COVID. Now, it clearly the processes of reassurance through uh, AstraZeneca haven't come to, to um, fruition and that's created problems for that. Um, and similarly, that the idea of immunization skepticism is long standing. So we need to understand what is it that builds into skepticism. The responses to um, the science of climate change has become a political object. So. The, and I think before it was a political object, it was generally uh, um, accepted, um, though some people felt like it was not, not, not really part of their, their concern or consideration um, and couldn't manage it. But it, when, as soon as it became politicised into a left versus right, it becomes highly problematic. Um, and so I think really we need to look at the social things that create and undermine trust and how do we build that? And when we have a, a system where uh, a new system that, and a media, social media system that thrives on um, um, extremism, um, it thrives on alternative facts, uh, that type of thing, um, it becomes very difficult to navigate. And so that's where I think a lot of the work needs to be done, not on the technology, 
Um, obviously, there needs to be importance to make sure the technology is working as it's such. We use iPhones quite, most people will use iPhones and 5G, um, but we also need to work out how can we build a, a, a robust social environment that supports these things. Kate, I saw you had your hand up. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to add to that really um, good good observations from Paul and, and much appreciated. I just think a couple of things. Um, so uh, Maximilian made a really good point about considering that you know, maybe we're talking about trust in a binary way because it's easier for machines. I, I actually don't think that is the right location for a current conversation on trust. And I'll give you the example back to Google Maps. What's interesting about Google Maps, uh, it's also true about video games in the modern day is that um, they are no, they're no longer about setting a product. Uh, like in the old days, we would um, write a piece of software and we'd deliver it. And in the games world, you might get a firmware upgrade or you'd have to get a new CD-ROM right, to like upgrade your game when you floppy, there was a bug in it. Um, the, the sort of the dynamic model of trust was not present in the old way of um, deploying software. But these days, um, you know, if you're if you're playing a game, uh, your data and interactions with the data are being constantly monitored. And if you don't enjoy something, if you get in basically a, a fun stop situation, you no longer engage with the game. The game is like, oh, geez, we better change the way this game plays, otherwise we're going to lose our players. Now that's done obviously because eyes on eyeballs on the screen are the key monetization for these games in a lot of cases. Um, sometimes done, you know, using gambling mechanics and terrible ways of keeping engagement, which you could say is unethical from the start. But if you choose an ethical operator that's saying, look, I want you to be engaged with Google Maps, and the way I'm going to get you engaged and keep you there is to be reliable and trustworthy. And so Google spent this huge amount of money, a huge amount of effort to map the streets and to try to signal trustworthiness to users to say, I actually know what your street looks like. There's a for sale sign on your house. We took a picture of it when you bought it. Um, there's your friend. Uh, and then you're just gonna build a trust relationship with me by using this product and seeing that it works. That when you wanna get from A to B, you get there and you get there in a way that is uh, maybe different to the way you normally drive, but we're gonna save you some minutes. And you're like, oh, okay, Google. I mean, it was a pain in the butt. I had to change lanes a lot. and do many turns but I avoided those traffic lights so thanks for the help so you actually we do have a relationship with technology um so that's one thing and it's an ongoing and constant relationship but that also gives us agency so if you look at uh, Shoshana Zupov's surveillance capitalism um and read into that surveillance capitalism literature and look at the data activism uh emerging data activism space there's a lot of push on what agency do we have so for example, we are encouraged perhaps to deceive systems if we want to maintain privacy, because we know that they're going to ask us our birthday and they know that they're going to ask us all this information that can be wielded against us. So where we can just lie about our birthday when we're registering for a product, you know, you, you, that's one way you can fight the system if you're forced to answer these questions before you can have access to a product. So Privacy is Power is another book I would recommend in terms of the way individuals can manage their own uh, uh, distrust relationships where right? they're like I don't trust you you're gonna have to do a lot more than this for me to trust you with these sorts of information about myself uh, so I'm going to withhold those those objects from you um, so I think trust is very dynamic in the modern context thank you Kate so we have let's call this the last question from the audience and then we'll do some wrap-up points uh, Ben asks um, is there any discussion to be had about the desirability of efficiency as an end to itself in tech design? Uh, it seems like none of the issues raised in the discussion today are particularly novel, rather they're the result of negative externalities generated by speed and efficiency, which new tech now allows um, things to happen in. Does anyone on the panel want to jump in with, with a first response to, to the question of the desirability of efficiency? Otherwise, I'll pick on I'll, Kate. Um, no, I would say, and <laughs> I, I think this, this is a great question. Um, I'll say Anna Wiener in her book, um, Uncanny Valley, talks about this in a really poetic way about how, um, and so she she worked for um, kind of several uh, tech companies, but how she she liked her inefficient life. And she writes about kind of enjoying things that others might see as a waste of time and yeah, doing things in an inefficient way and that there's um, something human about that. Um, and so I think this is, this is, yeah, an important point. Um, 
And I'll, I'll just say that I think often that efficiency that we're seeing sought is also it's efficiency in the in the service of corporate profits. Um, in particular, it's not um, you know, it's not efficiency so that um, workers in an Amazon warehouse only have to work four hours a day and then co can go spend their extra time, um, you know, with their, their loved ones. It's an efficiency that's actually causing them to, you know, get injured at higher and higher rates the more, uh, the more Amazon automates um, and uses robots. And so I think the, um, the purpose of that efficiency is a really important consideration as well of, um, you know, is someone wanting to be more efficient because they're going to get back that time and it's their own, or is this about kind of increasing corporate profits? And I think we see that also with a number of, I mean, these raise a lot of surveillance concerns, but, you know, various bossware monitoring employees and in this very invasive way um, in the kind of su supposed name of, of, of efficiency. And so I think thinking about uh, to what ends and who has the power in those situations is, is very important. But that's a, a great point from Ben. Let's go Paul and then Kate. Oh, thank you very much. Um, that's a great question. I agree. Um, yes, uh, technology has all, uh, well, especially digital technology has always been argued to create efficiencies. And I think that's a long standing um, discussion. Um, I remember um, it was uh, uh, Robert Solo made the comment in the, the late 20th century that he saw computers everywhere except for in the productivity um, statistics. Um, and so uh, we have to be alert to what is it the efficiency is. Certainly we can do things a lot faster in my own detailed studies about technology being used in governments. You can see the way in which things are happening um, the way in which uh, uh, the processes of engaging with government have become much easier in lots of ways than it than used to be. Um, but efficiency also creates opportunities for greater forms of of, of doing other things. So for example, if we do have driverless cars, that means that there are job losses in some areas, but it also enables things in other areas. Um, so we, need, we are constantly expanding what we do. We're actually not doing what we, what replacing humans and what they're doing in doing and losing jobs, which I think there's a big worry about how AI um, will lead to a loss of the, uh, of the future of work, for example. I think that's completely misleading because two centuries of technology have shown that there's not been less work over time. Um, but there, I think we also need to be critical about how efficiency it, it operates. Um, for example, one and I was doing my PhD, one of the most influential books that I came across was Ruth Schwartz Cohen's More Work for Mother. And it seems a bit odd for someone who's studying digital technology because she was studying domestic technologies in the 18th and 19th centuries in, the, in America. And what her key argument was is that you see all of these domestic toilet technologies are designed to save work, but how come the, the, the housewives of the mid 20th century seem to be having to still do the same amount of work that they were doing two centuries ago now, she, this is wound up with a whole gendered pattern, but the point that she was making is that as the technologies made things more easy, um, for example, that led to uh, greater use of angel cakes because the um, egg mixer that you could use by, um, by, with a mechanical one would allow greater use of those. It was a symbol of the upper class, but it also meant that there was a ratcheting up of expectations of what Good food. What 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 is a good house? What a uh, house house keep, um, household look like? Uh, what kind of cleanliness does it have? Now we have to be germ free, which actually we don't know. That's that's not actually a good thing. Um, so efficiency comes with a whole range of different things embedded into it, and there's very and yes, we need to make sure that we can do the best things efficiently. We also need to alert to the fact that there are the whole range of dynamics that occur, such as um, the way in which it actually can be used for control um, rather than efficiency. And I think that goes back to the question about from the NDIS and the, end, the way in which the independent assessments are supposed to work, it creates efficiency, but it is also being used as a tool to uh, reduce costs and actually reduce the actual levels of support for people with disability. It doesn't need to be, 
but we need to be alert to what other programs or projects that are happening alongside the efficiency project. So good, Paul. I love that example. It's brilliant number of hours that women work in order to maintain the higher expectations of the class system. Couldn't say it any better. Um, I just want to give an example um, of some of, it's such a great question, Ben, by the way. So the efficiency problem. So let's take our self-driving cars. I think it's always a great point of discussion where, um, of course, Google Maps gets us efficiently from one place to the next. And it's been noted that if you want to take the more beautiful path, then you might not want to have that algorithmic um, sort of decision strategy. So, you know, there's at least five different decision strategy buttons that I would like on my self-driving car. And, and, you know, one would be uh, that aesthetic path um, where you go around the mountain roads and see the beautiful scenery and, you know, the best views. Um, one program would be for me you know, getting lost, right? So you can um, look at everywhere I've been uh, I also call it the Truman Show model. So Truman, Truman had always been just the edge of his Truman Show bubble. It's like, well, what's beyond my bubble, right? Take me there, get me lost, right? Somewhere where I can't navigate my way out of it with any previous information as much as possible. Um, or serendipity, take me to where the people are, right? So I want to just go to a congestion place because I want to have uh, these in, you know, moments of collision with other humans and find things I've never found before. Um, or I follow the fun algorithm or adventure time where you're gonna take me to places where I'm gonna be stimulated with something novel and amusing. Um, or, you know, tell me a story where you take me along the historic and tourist route so that I get a sense of flow that comes from, you know, my, my culture or other people's cultures to tell me a story about their existence, but situated in place uh, so in, you know, geographically, so you could find those stories, you know, as you were embodied, as you moved through them. Um, so these are all inefficient, right? I mean, but they are efficient to the goals we set. So the goals we set are really important in order to figure out whether what we're doing is efficient, but also whether efficiency itself is a problem. Maybe efficiency isn't a problem if what we're trying to be efficient about is to as quickly as possible get into the experience of our lives the way we want to have them. So my efficiency in getting to barbecue American style is to get one of those big old barbecues and settle down for 12 hours. Uh, so we all you know, make smoked you know, meat and things like that that's the most efficient way to get to that barbecue experience, which is a slow food movement experience. But such a great prompt, thank you. I would love all of those buttons, Kate. Um, now in wrap up, I'm gonna give everybody one minute to change the world as we know it. So starting with Michael, if you could change one thing in how we manage emerging technologies, what would it be? Uh, cut the power. <laughs> um, not the not the electronic power, but the power of these the the technology companies. Uh, they're so powerful, and um, uh, well, uh, there's the 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 Western technology companies, if you like the the Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, are uh, taking us in a route a direction uh, where they're satisfying our wants, and. I'm not sure that's the right way to go. I don't think you give the baby everything it asks for, you know. Uh, otherwise, you end up on that ship in in the Wally -E movie. You remember Wally, -E, where you, you drive, you're riding along in a uh, wheelchair, sucking a, a soda, and watching a TV screen in front of your face for the rest of your life. Um, so I, I think uh, take their power away from them and take some control back um, uh, for yourselves. Okay, that's one and right. Thank you. And, and Rachel? Um, I would say to have uh, to have the people most impacted as the ones making decisions about should this technology even be deployed at all? If so, how? Um, and so, you know, in the example around disability benefits, people with disabilities should have a central role in determining are we going to use this technology? And if so, what are the parameters by which we use it? Um, but to really kind of, yeah, to give a, a, give the people impacted a much, a much greater say in if and how and when and kind of all the details around the use of this tech of, of a technology that will impact them. Kate, you're ready to go? <laughs> sure. I mean, those were great answers. So let me just accept those answers. Yes, yes. And also just add, I think we need education that is very broad in the humanities, is very obviously 
necessary and needed in humanities as well as that STEM push uh, and that our democratic capacity to have influence is really contingent on the degree to which any one of us can fight for the things that we think are the right things to do and that requires a lot greater knowledge bar around the technologies and how they might influence our society so education training expectation that people will come to jobs having done uh, the fast AI ethics course, for example, I mean, you know, you've got to have an expectation that to be a good uh, participant in our society, you need to come ready to discuss some of the ramifications of the use of these technologies. And Paul? Uh, well, Michael and Rachel took my two of my top ones. So I'm going to go very specific. Um, one of the things that I think looking at the example of robo debt and the way in which it was prosecuted in terms of a legal case is that the decisions of automated decision making are countered by questioning that decision and you can see the way in which the government refused to uh, re appeal anything that was done at the AAT because it didn't want to actually go into public recording. You saw how when there were specific cases it then just uh, uh, wiped the debt and said there's no case to answer. And it was only with the class action that the government was held accountable for that. Now the problem that I see in that is that ADM systems are uh, making decisions because of their algorithms. And it doesn't seem to be a clear way in which legal processes can challenge the systemic way of the algorithm rather than specific decisions. And if we're going to use technology to make decisions or do things, we need to be able to engage legally with the algorithm, not with each specific instance of decision, decisions it makes. Okay, so cut the power, shift the power relations, a broader education base, and uh, being able to engage with the algorithms directly. I think that's a pretty good wrap up for a 90 minute discussion. Thank you, everybody.